I am going to try to finish this point so we can talk about the journalism of it. The furry culture wants to remain private. In talking to Gamergate in the past three months, there have been some who have said and tweeted at me and emailed me that they don't want mainstream media attention, and I respect that. There were many more that said that they did. And in those conversations, we talked about how we have to kind of meet in this middle. Gamergate is probably going to have to change the way it talks, not change its message. Selling out does not mean, uh, or you can interrupt me again and I'll just, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Wait, actually, can I, can I say something? Because this isn't just Gamergate. I mean, this goes with everything. Like, if you want the media's attention, there's a certain, you, you approach them a certain way. By attacking them, it's probably not going to be the best way to do it. Um, it, that's not the best way to get anyone's attention, in my opinion. It but, was probably super difficult because obviously... Milo, you know what? The, can you not interrupt her when she's talking? <laughs> Thanks. No, but I think... you know, that would be sexist. <laughs> <laughs> well, when someone, when someone comes to me with a story, they tell me whatever they might want to tell me. I ask certain questions, and we have conversations in my newsroom about if we're going to cover it. A lot of that depends on... What's the, what's the outcome and what's the public's interest? How does this benefit the public in any way? How is this going to maybe make the community better? Is this going to expose something? And specifically, this is investigations. And if the answer is it's not going to help, or by us telling this, it's only going to help maybe one person, we're less likely to maybe do it. Those are the kind of the pros and cons that we weigh. We're here for more of the public good kind of wide range things. So I guess my question to you would be, if you came to me and you want me to write about Gamergate, what am I writing about, and why? Well, this is the problem, because the stated purpose of Gamergate is to, put, you know, to protest bad ethics in journalism. So it's, there's already that sort of opposition. So I understand what you're saying. It's, dif it's, it's difficult, because you know, Gamergate's default position is, journalists are crap. Can you write about how journalists are crap? <laughs> you know? So it, obviously, that, does, obviously that makes the start. How does that relate to difficult. Gamergate? See, I guess that's where I, compared to the conversation that we had with the other panel, yeah. that wasn't at all the understanding that I took about Gamergate. But maybe I'm... I, it wasn't journalists are crap, and no, that's I'm what you should write about. I know, but I guess that was not the takeaway. So I have a question. I can understand the reluctance of an editor to give the go-ahead for a story that's so amorphous, but it did not stop editors from writing with great authority about something they knew nothing about. They, there were many stories, hundreds of stories about Gamergate. They all followed the same storyline of of women who were imperiled and, and bad gamers. And it was, this was written over and over and over again. No one had the least inhibition. It just simply didn't occur to them to go to the other side. Maybe they, I mean, it, there wasn't another side. The, let's, yeah, I think let's, I kind of want to reiterate what Christina said, because I think the problem is not even so much that the media didn't cover Gamergate, it's that they covered it from a very one-sided standpoint, which is, you know, Gamergate is a misogynist harassment campaign. What if we, what yeah. if we stipulate, how about this, to try to move past this, what if we stipulate to everything bad that happened in the past, we don't even know all of it, but we're just going to give it to you. And can we talk about how to be better in the future? What if we just admit that let's we admit all it, but, but without, but let's mention there were some wonderful examples. There were reporters like Eric Kane and uh, Auerbach at Slate. David Auerbach at Slate. He did a wonderful job. Yeah. He tried to get the story and sought people out. They're models no, of in how to cover. No, and I, once I saw that, I thought, okay, <clears throat> this is going to catch on. It didn't catch okay, on. Let's, no, this, these are good examples, so this is something we can sink our teeth into. So I talked to, I talked to David Auerbach at Slate. Um, and Eric Kane, obviously, I've emailed him. And their beats allow them to do something a little different than other mainstream journalists. I think this is an important distinction, and you guys can back me up, that David Auerbach's beat at Slate, he's a tech writer. So he doesn't always write about Gamergate, but he can write about Gamergate. Right. Interestingly, at Slate, there is also a culture editor. And the culture editor can sometimes write about Gamergate. Interestingly, they can have totally different opinions when you read their piece. Yeah. Because they have, they have beats. They have something that they cover all the time. Eric Kane, same thing. What we're trying to get at here is mainstream journalists who don't have those beats. Because those beats mean that you are reaching a certain audience that's interested in tech or interested in what that culture writer is saying because that culture writer might do it the same way Milo does with that mixture. We're talking with Ren and Lynn about assigning general reporters 
to go cover this movement and to do that better and do the reporting better. So what we're asking you guys is to talk to these guys about how to do that. So let's just leave behind all the stuff that happened before because we weren't there for it, so we don't know who was right or wrong. And let's talk about how to do it better. So let me ask you a direct question. Getting back to writing a story about Gamergate. If I'm going to write a story about the year anniversary of Gamergate, which is coming up, you know, guys, Milo, you know this, journalists love anniversary stories, right? It's an easy way to get into a topic. It's the one-year anniversary of whatever it is. If I was going to write a one-year anniversary story on Gamergate, who should I talk to? If I'm Lynn Walsh and I'm assigning a story, who should she tell the reporter to go see first? Um, well, it's a story about press ethics. So you should go and talk to the journalists who are accused of ethical failings. Uh, you should talk, look at the public, go to speak to the editors in chief of Kotaku and Polygon, ask them why they changed their disclosure. Okay, well, hold on a second, Milo. She's looking at you like uh, she's confused. <laughs> yeah, I guess that completely like loses me. And again, this is someone who is not involved in the movement. And I mean, like, is there, so are there multiple people? Is this one person? I guess that's the, you know, like, is there one person? Are there multiple people that I should be talking to? Are these multiple publications? Are these reporters? Are these gamers? Are they editors? Um, are they news organization presidents? I mean, who are these people? I guess, Milo, what she's saying is you're asking her to start a story on Gamergate by not talking to Gamergate. <laughs> You're saying to go talk to game editors. That's what you said. Yeah, no, I would say, you know, I mean. How did you do it? Well, how did I do it? I mean, I talked to a lot of Gamergate people on Twitter, and I kind of tried to get a sense of who the people were. How did, tell us how you did that. Tell us, like, you go on Twitter and you see just all these posts. Did you break it down on a spreadsheet? And if everyone had, like, had been doing it for nine months, it was okay. But if for two days you didn't, if it was an egg account, tell us, like, some secrets. Uh, right. Well, I don't think there are any. See, I mean, you, you watch the hashtag for a few days. You try to see like who the most articulate posters are. You try to see, you know, who is getting retweeted. You try to see, you know, who's sort of more visible. In uh, I mean, so you found one of those people, you, and what you do next? Um, message them on Twitter and ask them if they would like to be interviewed. Um, you know, I spoke to several women, by the way, who were involved in this movement. Okay, so, when you, so, so when you angle. interviewed, so when you DM them, and did you conduct the interview, did they ever get their real name, or did you keep them anonymous? Uh, the people that I spoke to, I did get their real names, yeah. And uh, some of them were not willing to have their real names mentioned. I think most of them were. Uh, also, I think the other thing is just to actually watch what gets posted in the hashtag, because again, I think a lot of people who wrote about Gamergate you know, using the standard narrative didn't really look at the posts in the hashtag so much as, you know, again, they went with this preset narrative. And, yeah. uh, if, you, if, you, if you wanted some advice, for example, yeah. it would be good maybe to do what you did, which is actually watch what's happening. It's kind of when I was being yeah, glib, I was being glib though, and I said I did the work. No. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that's kind of what I meant, right? Rather than just sort of looking at what other journalists write and say, you know, when, when every other journalist has a very strong opinion on a subject and all of those opinions are, are pointing in the same direction, that makes people like me suspicious. Um, and that's what I, that's the kind of brain that I think journalists are supposed to have. Um, and it makes, it makes me go, what's going on here? So, you know, somebody came to me and said, this might be a story interested, and I, I did what Kathy did. Um, you okay, know. So let's, let's, let's drill down on that. So one of the things that mainstream journalists have, a, have an issue with is obviously we have to get people on the record. So you're saying that if we, the journalists reach out to people on Twitter, you could probably get a fair number of them to be committed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just Twitter, actually. There are also people on YouTube who have done yeah. videos that are pro gamer gate that you and can they're very reach. Media they're media-friendly. They're bloggers. used to talking. They're very yeah. articulate. Yeah. All right, so, so, so here's... Because so yeah. so, I want to get to these guys. Right. The question is, if I reach someone on Twitter and I think they're articulate and I talk to them and I quote them, how many of those people do I need, or what can I actually quote them saying? Because now I'm saying that they're, I'm asking them questions about how they feel about some movement that has no leaders. I don't know how to put that in context. So let me ask you, when you actually interviewed one of these people, what did they actually say? Just give me one example. If someone you quoted by name, what was their, what, would, what did you quote them saying? What was their message? Okay, well, it's going to be about feminism again, because one of, one of the best people that I've interviewed was a British woman named Sabrina Harris, who's a technical writer who's involved in Gamergate. 
And I specifically asked her, you know, what does she think about the perception that this is a backlash against women in gaming? And she gave and me her opinion. she told me, she gave me her opinion. She told me about her experiences as a female gamer and, you know, her view of uh, the type okay. of ideology. Uh, that I, I hear you. So now my question is this. Finish. Yeah, <laughs> you interrupted a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> No, I think Hold I'm on. done with my point. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, he told me off. Yeah. Tell him off for a second. No, I, I will repeat this from the morning, that this is not for Gamergate. This is for journalists and their readers. So I understand, I totally get it, that this is a Gamergate crowd, and you want to hear them talk about these issues. And I don't even got a problem with that. It's just that's not what this debate is. If that's what it's going to become, it can certainly become that. But it won't achieve the ends that you guys said that you wanted, which is to give these guys some idea about how to do their job a little bit better. I'm not interrupting them because I agree with them, I disagree with them, or I'm offended. I am just feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, but I can talk to some of the other journalists that I know are in this room, I don't know that it's helping that cause. So I'm going to try one more time, and frankly, if you guys feel that that's the conversation you want to have, you can have that conversation for the rest of the time that we're going to do this. I will just tell you this it won't have the ends that you think it will. I think the morning debate, I think we actually had some things we could try to do. Again, those may be modest goals. You guys have loftier ambitions. But I felt like we, we made some progress in the morning. Ask yourselves, you don't have to say anything now or you can yell at me. Do you feel like we made that much progress here today? This is not about reconfirming your own beliefs. This is about trying to talk to these guys. So I'm not, I'm not interrupting her because I'm trying to shout her down. I'm interrupting her because I want to try to get the information as quickly as possible. She did something cool, and I'm trying to get that over here. Okay. So let me ask Let's, one question about okay. this woman you interviewed, which sounds really good. Okay. And it sounds really basic to these guys or anyone listening right. on stream. Like, of course okay. we would talk. But that's not common. We are always taught that like anonymity on social media, people guard that with their lives. But let me ask you one question. So this woman, she talked to you, it was a good quote. Did you talk to a woman on Twitter that felt that it was a misogynistic movement? I mean, did you get the opposite of this woman in that story? Uh, not, not anyone that I interviewed personally, but let me, let me tell you why. Because the other point of view was already, I mean, I was in a way doing a counterpoint to a story that had been done many, many times. And I think, you know, the other point of view was represented very well. So in a sense, you know, my my objective was to do the counterpoint. Okay, and so I did summarize a lot of the arguments that were being made for, you know, by people who felt that it was right. a misogynist harassment campaign. I, you know, I mentioned the people who said that they were being harassed. And, uh, you know, so right. I think I, I certainly included the other point of view in that sense. Okay, but, well, so, so you know, let me my, get back to these guys because... Yeah. My understanding